Welcome back from intermission. I am Major Merger, also known as Sinclair Manning. I am Dr. Brian Mulligan. Hopefully you recognize me. <laughs> and we're up here to give you this month's top news stories in astronomy. <laughs> All right, so GMT. Uh, so construction has begun on the giant Magellan t Space Telescope in Chile. Um, the telescope, which uh, UT is a, a partner for, will have a total diameter of about 24 and a half meters and about four times as much light collecting area as current telescopes. Uh, site preparations began in 2012. Construction for lodging of the cr construction crew and astronomers began in 2015. And then finally, the actual peers for the telescope itself just started last month or this month, rather. Uh, so the telescope's expected to be completed and begin testing in about 2024. Uh, it's the first of the generation of, it's the first of the generation of extremely large telescopes, which includes the 30 millimeter telescope and the very well-named extremely large telescope. Uh, ELT and GMT are both being built in the Atacama Desert of Chile, where the high altitude and dry conditions are favorable for astronomical observations. Uh, the 30 meter telescope had been planned for construction in Hawaii. You've probably heard, I think, us talk about that as well as other stories that it's been very controversial. Um, and the permitting, the, 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 there's controversy over the permitting process. Construction has been delayed. It may or may not st still be built in, in Hawaii. Uh, for the GMT, the combination of the large collecting area and high resolution of the telescope is going to make it ideal for studying things that are very faint and very small, uh, things such as the first galaxies uh, that have formed in the universe, exoplanets, which are very faint and very small, and then supernovae, my favorite things, uh, in the first few days after they, they appear. All right, so in the early hours of August 12th, a Delta IV heavy rocket, shown here on the left, lifted up at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, carrying on it the long-awaited Parker Solar Probe. Uh, the mission has been sought after, ooh, okay, Solar Probe fans in the house. <laughs> uh, so the mission has been sought after for over 60 years since Eugene Parker, who the spacecraft is named after, first proposed that the sun sent out streams of charged particles that we now call solar Solar winds. Uh, over the next few weeks, the Parker Solar Probe will run through a series of tests to make sure its four instruments are working properly. It will then prepare for its first of seven planned Venus flybys uh, scheduled for October 2nd. Um, so after that, it will complete its first solar swoop in November. And each of these flybys of Venus are pretty cool because they'll act as a gravity assist maneuver to push the spacecraft closer and closer to the sun. Uh, so this will be the closest a spacecraft has ever come to the sun. Does anyone have an idea of how close it might come? No? It's, it's, it's a mere four million miles away from the sun, from the surface, uh, which is still really, really close. <laughs> Um, so the Parker Solar Probe will probe different depths of the sun's atmosphere, known as uh, the corona. And in addition to sampling different layers of the sun, the probe will catch our star displaying a complete range of activity since it undergoes an 11 year cycle from relative tranquility to some pretty tumultuous conditions. So this mission is planned to last until mid 2025 before running out of fuel and breaking apart, after which any remnants of the probe may still circle the sun indefinitely, uh, even perhaps until our sun explodes and consumes our entire solar system. So that's pretty metal, wow. I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I did not realize it, it, it was going to survive it just, that it long. It just keeps it's, going. It's not just going to get dragged down in? I mean, it's going to like decompose, but like you can see the carbon cloud of it, they oh, say, wow. oh, around really it forever. Cool. Well, not forever, but for the next new, however. A new meteorite stream for the interplanet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, speaking of meteorites, um, so uh, on the title I said asteroids, but two meteoroids were seen striking the moon within 24 hours of each other. I'm glad this graphic is working. I was worried. Uh, I love so that we're including see... GIFs now. It's yeah. like Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> so one, there's one, there's the other one. So those little flashes of light that you see are two meteoroids striking each other. They happened within 24 hours one of one another, the first on July 17th and the second occurred just shy of 24 hours later. Uh, they're observed by the Moon Impacts Detection and Analysis System, system or MIDAS, uh, 
It's a survey designed to watch the dark part of the moon specifically to observe impacts such as these. Uh, the meteoroids de de detected last month were likely a part of the Alpha, Alpha Capricornid meteor shower, uh, which are remnants of comet 169P slash NEAT. Uh, ask Dr. Comet what that means. <laughs> he might be able to give you more details. Um, each, each of those meteorites that struck it was only probably about the size of, of a walnut. So imagine the walnut oh. striking the moon at something like 30 kilometers per second. That's what happens. So the, the, Midas, the Midas survey is based in Spain. It's the success of a project that began in 1997. Uh, the observations that are made by Midas help us to understand the populations of meteoroids within these debris streams uh, that cause meteor showers, as well as generally in the, the solar system in the, the vicinity of Earth. Uh, the observations of the impacts also present an opportunity for follow-up uh, using satellites such as the Lunar Re Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh-oh. That's bad. <laughs> I see Apparently, it. gifts don't work. Oh, no. <laughs> We're not Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so to present this opportunity for follow up with the Lunar Reconnaissance, Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, to assist understanding of how critters form. All right, astronomers have spotted a huge black hole at the center of a very small galaxy called Fornax UCD3. Uh, the dwarf galaxy is about 60 million light years from Earth, and a satellite of the massive elliptical galaxy NGC 1399, which is at the uh, middle of this image, and UCD3 is down at the very bottom, and I apologize if people in the back can't see it because it's low on the screen. Um, <laughs> So it was observed using uh, the symphony spectrograph that is installed on one of the 8-meter telescopes of the very large telescope in Chile. Fornax UCD3 likely hosts a supermassive black hole that is about 3.5 million times the mass of the sun and comparable to the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. Uh, but remember, the Milky Way is over a thousand times larger than Fornax UCD3, making the black hole of this dwarf galaxy roughly 4% the total mass of the galaxy, while normal galaxies like our Milky Way have a much lower ratio of about 0.3%. Uh, so this is the fourth black hole discovered in such a small galaxy. And one hypothesis astronomers have for explaining these systems uh, is that tiny galaxies like this may host such huge massive black holes um, if long ago a more massive galaxy passed nearby and stripped away the majority of its stars, uh, leaving behind the dwarf galaxy and this compa compact nucleus of only a few uh, thousands of stars, which is like pretty rude. I would be mad if someone just came along and yeah. swiped yeah. all my mass away, but whatever. I guess that's how galaxies work. Um, <laughs> but to test this, astronomers will look to discover more of these ultra-compact dwarfs, as well as more massive but less dense compact elliptical galaxies. I, I wonder, too, if, if, if the uh, interaction maybe forced some of those stars into the black hole, which made the black hole bigger. Ooh, might, might explain how it got so big. should contact these people. Yeah, I should. <laughs> All right. Um, so iron and titanium have been found on a distant planet, a planet outside the solar system for the first time ever. So uh, Kevin Heng, not shown here, uh, he first became interested in a particular planet called Kelt 9b uh, because it's one of the uh, so-called ultra-hot Jupiter. These are planets that orbit extremely, extremely close to their host star and have a temperature that, uh, that is about 4,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, this is kind of temperatures that are more typical of stars than, than they are of planets. Um, this means that the daytime side of the planet acts more like a star than it does a, a planet, and molecules aren't able to form in, in that area of the, of the planet. Um, so Hing had suggested to one of his postdocs, Hin, Yin's Hige makers, <laughs> I'm guessing. That's a valid effort, I think. <laughs> um, so he asked him to investigate the possibility of, of finding something like iron on, on these sorts of planets on a theoretical basis. So Yens uh, spent some time doing, doing the theory and found that yes, actually iron would be really, really easy to, to find on, on a planet such as this during, as, as the planet passed in front of its star. Um, and then it turned out that a number, another member of the same group had already imaged 
this particular system that they were interested in. And so they went back through the, the old data and turned out, and it turned out, sure enough, they had detected iron and titanium years ago, just nobody had actually bothered to look for it. So now they found it, they published a, a paper. Um, this, sound, this, this is very exciting. It bodes very well for more detailed studies of exoplanets, especially the ultra-hot Jupiters. Um, being able to detect these, these elements, such as uh, iron and titanium, allow more accurate probes of the temperature of these planets, the chemistry, as well as the, the composition, and may help gain understanding of how these, these planets form. All right. It's now time for astronomy, not in the news. So a story that maybe astronomers have heard of, but hasn't gotten the press that it so rightly deserves. And, and my favorite story for this one. Yeah, if this uh, <laughs> image on the left looks familiar, it's because you just saw it a few times in our first talk, uh, why the galaxy person is talking about supernova and not the supernova expert. I'm not sure, but that's the way the news shakes out sometimes, I guess. Uh, <laughs> But in 1572, a little history lesson first, a supernova was observed, most famously by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. This type 1a supernova, known as SN 1572, or Tycho star, is seen today as this supernova remnant on the left, with layers of gas being expelled outward as a result of the explosion of a white dwarf. So it is believed that the explosion can be triggered when a white dwarf pulls too much material from a nearby companion star, or if the white dwarf collides with another white dwarf. So Pilar Ruiz La Puente uh, on the right looked to find the surviving companion that theoretically should still be intact, but would have been flung away and moving at high speeds uh, away from the explosion. So using the Gaia Space Telescope and its precise pres uh, position measurements, Ruiz La Puente looked at all the stars near the supernova to determine if any of them appeared to be the ejected companion of Tycho star. So considering various criteria, uh, including the distance from the star to the remnant, the velocity of the star, uh, and the direction it was moving, it was determined that star G, which is uh, circled in a little green circle on that image, um, was likely to be the companion, or was the best candidate for being the ejected companion, uh, particularly because it's of its unexpectedly high velocity. So while it seems like that star G uh, may be the companion, there's still a chance that Tycho star formed by the collision of two white dwarfs, in which case uh, both would have been obliterated, leaving no companion behind. And you can tell me if that sounds right. Yeah, uh, so, so I can provide a little more context. This, this, this has been the one interesting case. This is the only case which we might have maybe possibly found the companion star to a, to a thermonuclear supernova. G has been the, the candidate star for quite some time. Um, this sort of helped confirm that it is, it is still a good candidate. Uh, this star is interesting also because it has a lot of nickel in its outer atmosphere, which is something that we'd expect if it was in fact the, the companion star to a supernova, but it's still very, very, very controversial. So maybe yay, but maybe eh. Maybe yay. I like maybe yay better. I like maybe yay. Okay. I, I think Craig likes maybe yay if he's still here. <laughs> All right, that's all, right. all we have for you this month. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of the show.